is becoming extremely alarming uh, and such a breach in trust between doctors and patients. It used to be that doctors could not possibly raise the idea of euthanasia with their patients. It had to be patient initiated. Now, doctors are starting to fear that if they do not raise euthanasia as one of several healthcare options, they will face reprimand by the colleges of physicians and surgeons for not presenting to their patients all of the available options within Canadian healthcare. Welcome to the New Flesh Podcast, the podcast you deserve. My name is Ricky Orpike, and joining me once again is my good friend, Mr. Jonathan Astro. John, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, Ricky. Very good. Now, I, I, I'm not going to joke around in this intro because we, we're talking about a serious topic here. We're talking about death. <laughs> yeah, that's a sounds like a bummer, man. It's a big one. So you know, but but you shouldn't joke. Uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't play our, our guests like that. Uh, uh, Amanda Ackman, fantastic guest, uh, and we were just joking around with her a second ago uh, in the closer. I I am um, I'm just delighted that she came on our on our podcast. You know, um, I mean. It's pretty random, isn't it? I'm, I'm always surprised at when the guests say yes and they come. I on. can't believe it. I, yeah. I I get the emails and I'm just like I'm like what? I'm like and I feel like saying to some of them why, <laughs> you know? But anyway, yes. but anyway, yes. she's come she's come on <laughs> and, and I can't wait to talk about uh, death and dying. So let's do it. Now, we always tell you the truth here at the New Flesh Podcast, and the truth is we need your help. We need you to leave us a rating or review wherever you listen to the show. We're also on YouTube, so please subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a comment about a show you liked or perhaps one that you didn't. Word of mouth is also a very powerful tool, so please tell all of your friends. And finally, to our Uber fans, if you love what we do, you can send us a little cash via the Buy Me A Coffee platform. Any donation here is very much appreciated. And now on with the show. Amanda Achtman holds a BA in political science from the University of Calgary and a MA in philosophy from the John Paul II, or the second, how embarrassing, John Paul II, like he's the sequel, uh, Catholic <laughs> University of Loveland in Poland. She's worked as a political staffer and has penned articles for Law and Liberty. She is currently pursuing a degree in Judaic Studies and Jewish-Christian Relations at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. <gasps> Our crude bios never do our guests justice. And what's missing here is that Amanda has already lived a truly extraordinary life for someone so young. Amanda, welcome to the new flesh. Thank you for having me. Now, Amanda, you, you look very sunny there. I, I believe you're in Rome. It's summertime. How did you find yourself studying in Rome? Uh, uh, tell us about your journey and some of the places you've lived in and, and visited and, and, and what, what you're studying as well. Sure. Well, I happened to find this brand new program in Rome in Judaic Studies and Jewish-Christian Relations, which is really a perfect biographical match. I should be thankful they created a program that suits me so well because I was actually raised in a Jewish Catholic family. So getting to come to Rome because I saw a Facebook ad that said, do you want to study Jewish-Christian Relations in Rome? And I thought, oh, how exciting. And so I responded to that Facebook ad, learned about it, and then moved here two years ago to do this two-year program where really we have the opportunity to learn with rabbis and priests who are jointly teaching classes at a pontifical university. So this is a very pioneering effort in Jewish-Christian relations where there's really an opportunity to put into practice a lot of the developments that we've seen in the church uh, since the very important developments, for example, with Nostra Aetate, Vatican II developments that improve the relations with Jews, Jewish responses to the efforts on the part of the church. So it's really an occasion to step into that and to live some of it out myself. But you've also um, spent some time in Poland. That's right. So I moved to Poland for two years in order to study John Paul II. And really, this was inspired by a two-minute YouTube video. So it's interesting how a Facebook ad or a YouTube video has become the impetus for how to devote two years of my life there and here. And it was a very attractive two-minute video, also for a brand new program. And so I want to encourage people who don't exactly know what, what to do next, maybe what you're going to do next doesn't exist yet, because that's certainly been the case in my trajectory. Everything I've kind of walked into didn't exist until I did it. Uh, and so that's just, I think, an encouragement that uh, life is full of really exciting surprises that we cannot really plan or expect on. And so the Catholic University of Lublin launched for the first time an English language master's program in John Paul II. And this really appealed to me because 
Well, I had been to Poland before, but only once on a Holocaust study trip. I have a Polish Jewish grandfather, and actually he had died just about a week before I learned about this program. So I think this was really providential timing because I was very close with him. He lived with my family for several years throughout my young adult years. It was very formative. And I visited him shortly before his death. And I know it would have brought him grave kind of consternation that his only granddaughter was moving to Poland of all places, the place that he fled in order to study. And I also probably would not have left um, while he was still alive. So the timing was just incredible. I moved to Poland in a sense to steep in the difficult century, to steep in the difficult history. And I mentioned I had been there only once before. That was in the context of a Holocaust study trip to both Germany and Poland with 60 students from all across Canada and two Holocaust survivors. I went there basically on a dare. My grandfather had become a sort of staunch atheist, thinking if this is how God treats the Jewish people, he's not very reliable. And he, he challenged me to go study the Holocaust and see if that would kind of shake my faith. And uh, it certainly challenged me and confronted me, but the experience really led me to a passion for ethics, for human life, for human dignity that I've carried with me until now. Well, we're definitely going to get into all those topics. Uh, and you, you've, you've walked straight into my next question. Uh, might as well dive straight in because I saw some videos of you uh, Oh, forgive me. I, I think I saw a video of you at Dachau. Is that correct? Edward? Yes. Well, I, it, it was you uh, uh, um, sort of talking us through a particular site at, at Dachau. And it just got me thinking, do you think it's important for us to visit sites of atrocities? Um, because this is this is a very hard sell to people. Me personally, I, I went to uh, Hirosh uh, Hiroshima and visited the dome where the bomb went off and attended a museum not too far from there. And I basically spent a full day weeping and hoping that my sunglasses would hide my puffy red face from everyone. Uh, I, most people spend their lives sort of avoiding this discomfort at, at all costs. W what can they get out of, of going to Dachau or Hiroshima or, or, or places like that? Mm -hmm. It's a great question, and I certainly met that question throughout my experiences of sharing with others that I've chosen to go on this Holocaust study trip and eventually also on a Rwanda genocide study trip. And so some people are incredulous about the value of this, and yet I can say that not a day goes by that I do not recall these trips in some way. They are so formative and so constitutive of the heart of my education and identity in a way that no other travel quite compares. I think that's because of facing up to the ultimate human questions, to the most significant themes of human life, and to having the experience of listening to rescuers and survivors. This has been the most precious value of all. I know that now they're starting to create holograms of Holocaust survivors so that using AI, students in an auditorium can have a simulation of listening to survivors. I will always cherish, to an extreme degree, my ability to hold the hand of survivors walking through these sites. There is nothing like it. It's so precious, and it leaves an indelible mark on your soul to be in these places. It's also a way to honor the dead. It's only by going there that you really make contact in this visceral and uh, completely present way. So. Uh, I can't really say enough about the value of, um, of of it. Difficult as it is, but that's the point. That's the point. And that, that, honestly, I think is a way to honor victims, survivors, rescuers, and the communities who suffered these atrocities and continue to flourish in our world, thank God, today all around the world. Now, I've got a massive question for you, but but you have thought seriously about this topic for, for so long. I, I think it's okay to go there. What's your view on death and how have you arrived at that position? Certainly, it's a topic that consumes me and, in fact, that I think about every single day. I think these experiences early in life led me to have a great sensitivity to death, which, above all, has enhanced my appreciation for life. Really, death is what makes life significant. The fact of our mortality lends significance to life. There's a beautiful quotation by German philosopher Robert Spayman who says that significance 
is meaning toughened by the consciousness of finitude. Significance is meaning toughened by the consciousness of finitude. It's when we realize the shortness of life that we realize its preciousness. If you knew that you were having your your last phone call or your last meal with someone, you would probably conduct yourself differently. And I think by constantly reflecting on death, it has enabled me to cherish every conversation, every encounter in a deeply profound way that honestly makes life so much deeper, richer, and fuller. Mm. Well, it seems as though there are, are an increasing number of adults who have lived well into their 30s without having experienced the death of a loved one, which, which you know, I, I guess is a positive of, of modern medicine as well, if you think about it. But we seem so detached from death these days. Uh, you know, if you lived in Charles Dickens' time, death was all around you, particularly the death of, of children and, and women in childbirth. Do you think this detachment was one of the fact, one factor that that contributed to the extreme reaction to the COVID pandemic? It could be. In my life, another experience that I had of death that led me on this trajectory was the experience of my younger brother. I was only two years old when he when he died, and he was seven months. And I was not shielded from his death, even though I was so young. In fact, we have home video of me closing his little casket, and I'm the last one to close his casket. And thankfully, my, my dad had a lot of home video. He even has home video of a day in the life in the hospital, of his entire funeral. And growing up, I wanted to watch those videos. At first, simply because I recognized everyone in them, and I liked seeing aunts and uncles in a movie. But as I grew, it became an appropriate way to sensitize me to the reality of loss, and especially to commemorate him. And this was done with a kind of naturalness that is exactly as you say, rather rare in our time. Many of my friends uh, have had similar experiences, and yet without that degree of intentional commemoration. We have also, for example, a, a handprint that was made of, of my brothers, and um, it's on a mounted uh, plaque on the wall. And whenever I go home and we take family portraits, we include that uh, plaque, we take it off the wall, and either my brother, my younger brother, Evan, or I will hold it in the family photo. And so it's a way of saying, you're still a part of our lives. As a, a sort of liturgy for, for funerals would have it, with death, life is not ended, but changed. And throughout all my experiences of education and adventure and work, that is very much basically the theme of my life. Because I find really that with death, life is not ended, but changed. Our relationships to the dead change, but when you have a sensitivity to how a person kind of transcends this earthly world, you're able to remember them, to to bring them into your life in a way that makes your life include them. And this is just marvelous. It's something that makes us distinctly human. The fact that through memory and identity, he in a sense makes my family more my family every day. The way that I relate to my parents and my younger brother is completely transformed by his presence, short as his life was. This is kind of a miracle of, of humanness that I think we could recover when we bring death a little bit more back into life. Amanda, that that's uh, a, a, such a unique and, and rather beautiful uh, uh, way of putting things. So we might as well go there. What do you think of the secular view of of because I would say that you're talking about you're talking in ways that um, you would just never hear from the sec from secular sources people uh, or just you know it, what it means to be a, your average liberal person out there they're not encouraged to they never talk about transcendence they never talk about the metaphysical never talk about you know people living on or or you know the soul or anything like that so so what do you think is the effect of 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 that Rather, almost complete uh, uh, domination of, of the secular view in, in relation to what you just said? Well, in a sense, I think it's so much remedied through traveling. And, and maybe people who are secular, who like to live life and travel, would do well to kind of realize how much travel is enhanced by the presence of death and a sense of transcendence pointing toward the future. When I was in Poland, and now especially in Rome, I, I often 
have the thought that you would think that atheistic materialists would create the most beautiful things if this life is all that there is and all that we have to live for. But that's certainly not the case, having also seen the effects of post-communist uh, uh, or the effects of communism being in sort of post-communist environments and this kind of thing. It's the exact opposite, that where there is a belief in transcendence, we see the highest art and the most beautiful culture and civilization. We see a desire to preserve things and to testify to uh, immortality. And so I really think that simply by having the experiences, we can introduce and rehabilitate this sense of transcendence. It's really a sort of existential poverty that you speak to in a secular environment that would lose touch with this because it's almost impossible to travel to a place and not be interested in in history, which is really to be interested in the dead. It's to kind of make friends with the dead. And when I speak about my trips, and as I speak now, this is simply a sort of millennial enthusiasm for travel. Yes, it's connected to transcendence, and yes, it's connected to to these deeper themes that completely help it to flourish. But I see it as such an accessible point of entry that makes people think, and that is possible for people who maybe weren't raised with a lot of religion or with a lot of access to the tradition, because there's something there that just immediately attracts and makes you wonder, how will I be remembered? Like, for example, when I'm in uh, Athens, for example, looking at ancient Greek funerary monuments, one thing that really struck me is that a lot of the monuments I saw that we still have today are family funerary monuments. They're not just individuals. They're family scenes depicting a sort of dining scene, for example. And so I started to wonder, what would it look like if my family had a funerary monument of us at the dinner table? And it, once you start to picture that, or even if you encourage someone to draw it for themselves, to sketch it, would people have their phones all on the table in their family <laughs> funerary <laughs> monument? <laughs> it just wouldn't look as good, right? You wouldn't want that to be discovered 2,000 years ago. It would be embarrassing. And so I think simply kind of playing with these ideas and letting ourselves put ourselves into the scene helps us to kind of reproach and admonish ourselves in a way that doesn't just make us feel bad about ourselves or maybe the lack of uh, contact we have with tradition, but that simply elevates us and raises us up. And that's really how I feel that art and travel has has called forth the best in me. There are those things that in a sense, we cannot bear because they, they just so much exceed us. The amazing art in Rome, the, the fascinating churches throughout Europe, the depth of the tradition. In a sense, it's a reproach to all that is ephemeral, to all that is instantaneous and fleeting in our lives. And yet, once you allow yourself to be turned around uh, because of that, you realize, okay, now I now I intimate what is of ultimate value. Now I'm going to go live just a little bit differently because of this. I I really love your observation there of of uh, secular art versus sort of religious art. I, I I just think of of brutalism, which is that that style of architecture, which is just basically massive cubes and and rectangles and stuff. But uh, religion used to provide a sense of meaning around death and, and and the grieving process through different rituals, like depending on on the religion, of course. And you've sort of already touched on this, but do you think grieving is harder in the largely secular world we're currently living in? Certainly. And yet there are so many communities that practice grief in a way that is really, really exemplary, I think, if only we step into it. So last summer I was in Lebanon and uh, a friend of mine, her mother died during the time that, that I was there. And I went and I visited with her and all the women were gathered outdoors and all of them were wearing black. There was no memo, there was no WhatsApp message about everyone please wear black. It was just known that this is what you do and that we enter into the solidarity and that we're going to show up and that we're going to symbolize our grief with you. And many communities will do such such a thing. I think that a lot of diaspora communities living in Western countries are maintaining these cultures and traditions, and yet they're doing it in a sort of hidden way. And so what's important is that we start to invite those expressions to come forth and to enable our culture to benefit from the breadth of tradition. Being a Canadian, and a, as many of our countries uh, are similar, we really have these communities from which 
we have so much to gain. We don't want them to purely assimilate to whatever our countries entail, but we want them to bring the best of what they have to offer. Uh, so I'm I'm very determined to basically plumb the riches of multiculturalism through calling forth the best expressions of grieving, suffering, dying, and caregiving. And I think that's a little bit out of the box because many people are critical of multiculturalism or think that this undermines uh, sort of patriotism or or a sense of national life. I absolutely uh, think that it's it's quite the opposite, that we become more fully who we are when we sense our identity in the presence of the other, when our identity is both fortified by uh, the contact with the other, and then we have to discover more completely who we are. I think a lot of times multiculturalism can make people insecure because of precisely that lack of identity and solidity. But when you know your own tradition, you can be confident enough to engage and to learn from others. You're in the country for this question, Amanda. Do you think it's fair that if I die that my wife should have to wear black for the rest of her life? <laughs> You can you can negotiate it with her. I would, I, and particularly if I die young too. I'm like, no, you've got to do it. Sixty years, the whole bit, like just, you know. Show what's some interesting about specifically what's interesting specifically about uh, my study of, of Jewish tradition is learning about how uh, stipulated grief and mourning is within within Orthodox Judaism. There are certain rituals that are prescribed for the first month, for the first um, year, and once that month has passed and once that year has passed you stop doing certain rituals because you have to give death only its due and not an inch more so that is quite an interesting view that actually serves to protect the the primacy of life while making space for grief and also saying that there's a limit that there's a sort of um time bound nature to grief which is to say you'll never get over the loss of of person We'll never get over the loss of you, for example. And yet, in order to progress through the stages of of loss, and especially for the community, to be able to reciprocate in turn to other community members and to be available, it, it demands a kind of ritual and liturgy. And so I think that's also something we've lost touch with because we're straddled between not grieving at all or grieving indefinitely or grieving 20 years later in a therapy session because we didn't have any of the rituals imminently following the death, things like that. But really, what cultural and religious traditions do is they provide a framework so that you don't need to think in a moment when you're not really able to think anyway. That is immensely valuable. You don't want to plan in, you don't want to think. And so people bring food over to the people who are grieving. People attend to you in certain ways that are unspoken. And there's not ambiguity. Another challenge of our time is there's such a loss of the mores and people don't know what to expect. Well, with traditions, you simply have a sort of go-to expectation, both as giver and recipient. And that is immensely valuable as well. Well, Amanda, we're, we're keen to talk about the situation in Canada, which we'll get to very shortly, but maybe to, to just sort of put a, put a full stop on, on this particular topic. What, what advice would you give to parents who have to guide kids through the loss of a family member? Yeah, that's a good question. I think commemorating the family member is really important within the family's own kind of culture, both as a family and within the traditions that make that family most that particular family. So... We all kind of have our own particular experiences, which uh, I don't want to simply project the the means that I was given to, to sort of grieve my brother. And yet we, we need help and inspiration from others. So I think also parents talking to other parents would be very helpful. Whoever is in your circle and community, let it be a topic of conversation. I'm very, very frequently speaking with my friends about the loss of miscarriage and how difficult it is to speak about among parents about how um, about how much longing there is to commemorate these children who are lost. And so I think really just realizing how much people are hungry for these conversations. Like I brought it up at dinner the other day. I was sitting at a table of six in my residence and three people, just because I mentioned the word miscarriage, three people shared, oh, I had a sibling who was miscarried. Oh, I miscarried my third child. Like all of a sudden people had this opening 
And so I would just encourage people to be audacious. Mention your own loss. Mention the loss that you know is not being spoken about. And from there, you will have so many beautiful, intimate conversations of high trust. And those are what make life meaningful. You will not regret it. You will find such a deep intimacy with whoever you are conversing with that is itself a soothing balm and consolation that you would never have expected. Well, Amanda, it's time. What is going on with assisted dying in in Canada? This is big. Yes. So MAID is the Canadian acronym for Medical Assistance in Dying, also known as euthanasia or assisted suicide. It's more precisely euthanasia because persons are being killed in hospitals by doctors and nurses, not so much uh, taking their own uh, substance themselves, but really being given uh, a lethal injection by, by doctors and nurses in our hospitals under the guise of healthcare. So I mentioned that I went to Poland, and that was in 2015, right after my grandfather passed away. And it was in 2016, so while he was there, that the Canadian government legalized euthanasia nationwide. And at first, there were some limits, there were some so-called safeguards, and there was a lot of language about irremediability of suffering being a criterion for people accessing uh, euthanasia. And I even hesitate to use language like this, accessing. What, what is access to, to being killed? Um, so this really weighed on me, particularly because I was in Poland, steeping in the history of the Holocaust, remembering my grandfather, who was 96 years old, who thankfully came to Canada in 1937, but all of the uh, extended family had been killed in, in the Holocaust. And I was every single day contemplating contemplating this, where is our value for the elderly? Uh, Where is our value for uh, life when it's difficult and messy and gritty and painful? So I was was thinking about it every single day. Many people ask me, well, what are you going to do with a degree in John Paul II studies? And I usually said, hopefully I will humanize the culture. I will seek to humanize the culture in Canada. And I didn't know how that would... uh, play out, of course, like I was saying at the beginning, life is full of kind of the unexpected. And this is especially the case in politics. I could have never imagined when I was young that I would devote myself to trying to prevent euthanasia and encourage hope in Canada because it didn't exist. And now this is a new challenge that I feel very called and determined to meet. So I moved back to Canada and I began working with a member of parliament. And it was during the course of that work in parliament that the government tried to expand the legalization of euthanasia on the basis of disability and mental illness. So already we were having thousands of people being killed each year uh, in hospitals, but this was going to go even further and expand the criteria so widely and eliminate all of those safeguards that had been deemed essential just a few years earlier. So here was our chance to speak into the culture and to try and put the brakes on this already very dehumanizing legislation. So I began working with that member of parliament and it was very, very difficult because we saw how many people in parliament were supportive of this expansion, that we were quite, quite a minority in trying to stand with indigenous groups, groups advocating for persons with disabilities and mental illness. Um, for working with psychiatrists. We, we had a lot of stakeholders who were very, very alarmed. And nevertheless, there was such a zealous kind of push to to remove all of these safeguards. And so I can share a little bit more about those uh, couple years and what we did to mount resistance. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the beginning of it. It, it, just to be clear, what, what what is the process? So is, how is it easy to sign up to this program? What are the actual, you know, thresholds? You know, how do I how do I qualify? Yeah. So in the past, there used to be a mandatory wait period. There used to be a need for two independent witnesses, and you need to, you needed to be dying. And of course, we're all dying, so uh, those goalposts are are always moving. Uh, but it needed to be a sort of imminent uh, death, as deemed by physicians. But these are the safeguards that really got changed, such that 
there are now two tracks and there's a sort of track where if you're imminently dying, you don't need to wait the 90 day period. You could be killed much sooner. And there's no longer a need for two independent witnesses. Now there's only one witness, but often these witnesses are people who kind of are motivated to be euthanizing people. So it's very sinister that they are serving as the witness. They might be impartial, but that's precisely what's terrifying. When you have an impartial, objective, kind of anonymous uh, witness deciding that you are eligible. So we've seen the criteria ever expanding. Uh, at first, most people who were sympathetic to it had in mind the cases of extreme suffering uh, involved with, for example, ALS or cancer, many cancer patients. And a big part of why this is such a crisis that euthanasia has become so popular is it really diminishes the efforts on the part of our healthcare system to provide palliative care and to even help people improve. It's such a giving up. It's such a lowering of the standard. That's really what's a shame. But what's even more kind of dehumanizing, in my opinion, is that whatever you determine is a basis for which someone might be eligible for euthanasia, whatever that is, if it's cancer, if it's ALS, whatever condition it may be, then you are saying to everyone who has that very same condition but wants to live, what are you thinking? And that is extremely sinister and and gravely wrong in my view because it's a projection of saying your life is not quite uh, worth living. I'll tell you a story from Twitter. There was a man who tweeted that he, uh, so this man uses a wheelchair and he went to the pharmacy and he was simply picking up some items when a man, a stranger, came up to him and said, I could never do what you do. And the man thought, this is a little weird. I'm just picking up some Tylenol. And the man said, no, no, no. If I was in a wheelchair, I'd rather be dead. Oh my God. And he said this to the man who uses a wheelchair. And even just, just today, I checked Twitter and uh, I was speaking about euthanasia and uh, disability inclusion. And someone wrote, personally, I'd rather be euthanized than live in pain or without the ability to communicate. Now, if we think about what that means, in pain or without the ability to communicate, I would rather be dead. You both and all of your listeners know someone who is in pain and or unable to communicate, or you will or you have known such a person. And to say that this person would have been better off dead because someone else cannot tolerate their suffering, it is not about the intolerable suffering of the person. It is about we, whoever would be a, a proponent of this, being unable to abide the difficulty and tolerate the suffering. And it, it really says more about that person's anguish and inability to meet um, the meaning of suffering in this life than it does about the person who is suffering. For the suffering person, we owe our utmost. We don't owe abandonment. We owe all of our attention, all of our resources to try and help them to live. And yes, there comes a point where death is natural and we must allow it and, and accept it. But to directly cause someone to die willfully, and especially to decide on the basis of their suffering or their inability to, uh, in the Canadian language, there was a survey done by the government of people who were requesting euthanasia. And the number one reason people listed, they have to specify the kind of suffering that led to their request for euthanasia. And the number one kind of suffering that led Canadians to request euthanasia is a loss of ability to participate in the activities that make life meaningful. A loss of the ability to participate in the activities that make life meaningful. Euthanasia in Canada and everywhere is a symptom of existential distress, existential crisis. This is why I can so confidently devote my life to it, because it touches every aspect of existence and meaning, which is why I find it so interesting. It's not just one bioethical issue among many. It comes down to the whole nature of existence and the meaning of life. 
And this is the crisis we're seeing. So I read often the obituaries of people who have sought euthanasia. And what I find is that they already lack an ability to find out what makes life meaningful long before this request. That crisis of lacking meaningful activities does not come with illness. It's much prior. And so it is so essential that we fortify ourselves with a meaningful life before illness and suffering and death. This is also why I have conversations about death every day now, because when you're dying is not the moment that you want to enter into this kind of consideration for the first time. When you're grieving is not the first time that you want to, to enter into this. So we need to prepare ourselves. We owe it to ourselves to prepare ourselves. Now, th th this idea of suffering you know, is is somewhat subjective and and on a spectrum as well. Like if you think of someone who who may have been depressed in their youth and suicidal and might have overcome that, uh, if they had that option of of assisted dying or euthanasia, I mean, they may have taken that uh, prematurely. Um, do you have any sense that that the government uh, has tried to pin down a definition of suffering or or kind of worked out what that threshold of suffering is? You know, um, do you have any ideas? It's constantly shifting, and this is what's so dangerous about it, and it is very relative. Because of the emphasis on things like choice and autonomy and dignity, these are terms that are very, very subjective. They cannot really be assessed by the so-called maid assessors, especially if someone is a maid assessor, then they are a professional at determining people's eligibility to be killed by a doctor. And so there's not a serious interest in the good of the patient. Uh, with this. So suffering is something that is is quite a mystery in this uh, whole conversation. And yeah, like it's it's so important that we figure out um, like not just a sort of criterion because this is never going to be good. Like I don't think that euthanasia should ever happen uh, because it's the direct killing of, of an innocent person. And yet it's worth asking people questions about the nature of their suffering and what do they lack. Because we're finding people who are living without disability supports, who cannot afford housing, who are going to food banks and then asking for euthanasia and getting approved on the basis of a disability or some other factor. But they say the real reason for my request is something else. So there was a story of Amir Farsud, immigrant to Canada. He was uh, approved for euthanasia on the basis of his disability, but he told his doctor directly that he was applying because he could no longer afford to live in the, in the place that he was renting, and he was approved. Nonetheless, he, he was approved. Now, some people heard this story, and Canadians are uh, generally full of goodwill and can be very philanthropic and come to the support of their neighbors when they know that a neighbor is in crisis. And so a GoFundMe page was quickly set up, and I think more than $60,000 was raised for him in a couple days. And he was overwhelmed by the support of anonymous strangers who said, oh, like, this, this, this can't be. We're here for you, and, and we will show that, that uh, there is another way that you can live. And so now he's still alive, and there are many, many stories like this. It shouldn't take a GoFundMe, it shouldn't take a crowdfunding project to save people's lives every time. Euthanasia is a cry for help. And just also on the, on the point about suffering, because I spend so much time studying the Holocaust, it really hit me that the kind of suffering that people endured in the Holocaust is akin or vastly exceeding the kind of suffering that people think qualifies someone for euthanasia. And if we sent the message that this kind of suffering, any kind of suffering at a certain threshold, is what justifies euthanasia, we wouldn't have Holocaust survivors because it would be so foolish and, and irrational to live in the face of such suffering. But what do we see? We see the exact opposite. We see such a will to live, such a determination. Even more, we see a responsibility to live even against a person's own will. Some people, they might have wanted to give up, but they testify that they felt such a sense of responsibility not to contribute to their own dehumanization through um, ceasing to exist themselves. And I think many people are fascinated and uh, enthralled by 
the stories of Holocaust survivors. Why is that? Many people are uh, watching shows like America's Got Talent, Britain's Got Talent, Australia's Got Talent, these talent shows. They are full of contestants who suffer things. And what makes the show that the show that it is, is that we see these preamble videos about what they've endured, or we see them perform in the face of having cancer or being blind or having autism or having been homeless. And people love these shows. Well, let's ask ourselves, what is it that we love about these stories? It's because, yes, there has been suffering. And from that suffering, they have not given up. They have set, They have found meaning. They have put in so much effort. And there's a heroism. And a life without suffering is a life that lacks opportunities to be heroic. But we all naturally admire the heroism of people who suffer well with a magnanimous spirit so let's follow this through uh amanda is there australia's own peter singer has talked a lot about uh this topic of euthanasia and um he was you know i don't think he has necessarily has an opinion on it he's just laying out the philosophical you know boundaries of 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 this but are we are we likely to see parents, for example, pursuing euthanasia for disabled children on grounds of being unable to cope or, oh, look at him, he doesn't know what's going on, it's best that he just, you know, we end the suffering or whatever. Uh, could this could this be part of, I mean, if you say the, the, these thresholds keep keep moving, is this, is this something that we could see happen in Canada? We have already seen these conversations happen at the level of political discussion with some people, for example, from the Quebec College of Physicians and Surgeons. There were two representatives, including the president of the Quebec College of Physicians and Surgeons, who were uh, testifying and proposing exploring euthanasia for infants between zero and one who have extreme forms of suffering. And in one of those clips, the person testifying says, we must also take into account the suffering of the parents. And that is obviously extremely concerning. We're talking about children who cannot consent. Uh, and so those arguments about consent and autonomy are then uh, very much erased. And and the good of the child is totally surrendered to uh, this idea that someone else cannot abide their suffering. Now, this too was a cry for help. Parents with children with extreme special needs um, need a lot more support and accompaniment. But not only that, I am convinced that we as a culture owe it to them and owe it to ourselves to celebrate the quiet and hidden heroism of raising children who are very, very um, challenging to raise without a doubt, who, who demand a lot and every child demands a lot in their own way. But I, I think if we really value what these parents are doing, the sacrifices they are making, we've got to start celebrating it and giving it a window into their lives to demonstrate uh, also the needs that they have and come around them to meet those needs. Because again, like this is a cry for help. And the answer is to respond to the cry for help, not to eliminate the, the basis for the cry um, by eliminating human beings. So uh, all of this, it's just an extension of I think living in very individualistic, atomized society where people feel that they need to do it all on their own, this is this is the underlying problem. Well, if if Canada is anything like like Australia, I'm I'm, I'm sure there are many helplines and other mental health organisations who receive you know government funding to help prevent suicide, but but they're now having to work within a, a government framework that that allows assisted dying. Um, how is this dissonance between prevention and, and assisted dying playing out? That's a very important and excellent point. It's a huge tension because how do we have a regime of suicide facilitation on the one hand and suicide prevention on the other? Which suicides do we seek to prevent and which ones do we seek to facilitate? It's it's a very troubling dichotomy. And you mentioned the helplines and all of this. I know for a fact that many families are hesitant to make those phone calls, to bring even family members to hospital for fear that euthanasia will be encouraged for their family member or for their for their uh, family member in distress, experiencing mental, um, 
mental health challenges. I heard a story from during the pandemic of someone living with a mental illness. A doctor was telling the story um, and she was telling it on the radio where a patient went to the hospital, suicidal ideation, and they sent over the maid team to assess this person for euthanasia. And he said, no, I came to the hospital because I'm having suicidal thoughts, not because I want to die, but because I, I'm counting on you to help me get out of this. And so it is becoming extremely alarming uh, and such a breach in trust between doctors and patients. It used to be that doctors could not possibly raise the idea of euthanasia with their patients. It had to be patient initiated. Now doctors are starting to fear that if they do not raise euthanasia as one of several healthcare options, they will face reprimand by the colleges of physicians and surgeons for not presenting to their patients all of the available options within Canadian healthcare. This has all changed very quickly and it's honestly hard to keep the pace with, but we are seeing such a break in trust between uh, doctors and patients and it is devastating to this relationship. When we go to the doctor, we are not autonomous. We are not this autonomous individual uh, who can, like it's anyone who has gone to the hospital in a state of vulnerability, anyone who has watched a loved one in a state of, of extreme vulnerability, this is not a moment of autonomy. This is a moment of dependency. And we keep trying to uh, project an ideal of autonomy onto vulnerable patients and also act as if vulnerability is something pejorative. Some people say, don't say vulnerable patients because that's pejorative. No, we are all vulnerable, and especially in our uh, role as patient, whenever we, we are a patient. So I think we've got to kind of recover recover this and insist that it is not humiliating to suffer, and it's not even uh, humiliating to die. It is humbling. It is, it is a form of suffering. Just to die is suffering um, because we're being severed from this life and from our relationships. So there's no way around around that it implies suffering. But how we respond to it is where we have the opportunity to, again, be heroic and magnanimous and accompany people, not simply abandon them. Did you want to talk about your project that you embarked on in response to, to, this, to this campaign? Sure. So while I was working with the Member of Parliament, we did a couple petitions and we asked people to uh, signed petitions opposing the expansion of euthanasia on the basis of disability and mental illness. And because of the responses we received to those, we were able to email people and ask for their stories about how the expansion of euthanasia on the basis of disability and mental illness would specifically affect them and their loved ones. Well, in like three or four days, we received hundreds upon hundreds of emails. This was very difficult. I was working in this office during the pandemic, amidst all the events of the time, amidst many other difficult, dark political issues. And then I was pouring over these hundreds of stories of people begging and imploring us not to allow this expansion that would jeopardize the lives of them and their loved ones. So I realized, really, that it seemed to me we don't even so much have a culture of death in Canada as we're starting to have death without culture. We've removed the sort of cultural tenor and meaning from death and dying that makes us able to contend with it with a sort of maturity and humaneness to it. And so because of that lack of culture, and because of the stories that I had read in the context of the political work, I made a New Year's resolution on January 1st, 2021, to blog about death and dying every single day for an entire year on a blog called dyingtomeetyou.ca. Every single day. And for me, this was really a cathartic New Year's resolution because I wanted to try and discover the antidote. I think I didn't even use the word euthanasia in the entire year because I was trying to so much find an alternative vision to meet this existential crisis in our society. So I was exploring death across cultures, across um, different religious traditions, across ages, uh, young people, old people, people with disabilities, Indigenous Canadians, uh, 
interviews, uh, reflections on poetry, on pop culture, on all different things, because 365, it's a lot of content to come up with. So every day it was something different. And in fact, sometimes it was almost midnight. I still needed to come up with a story and I would just push myself to write. And that challenge, that challenge itself was extremely enlivening for me. Sometimes because of the restrictions, I didn't have that many people I could easily interview face to face. So I would often make a phone call to a friend and my friends know me well enough to not be too startled when I would say, I need to write a blog post. Could you tell me about a death in your family? And turns out everyone had one. And they really appreciated, again, the openness that the the opening that this was for them to share. So that blog got 15,000 unique visitors over the year. And it was simply a personal project. So I think that speaks to uh, the, the hunger for a conversation about death and dying and for a better, more human way to die um, in our societies that are now becoming kind of enamored with euthanasia as, as an escape. So this is what I'm determined to doing um, in the future and as I return to Canada to seeing the value that others don't see and affirming it to meeting the difficulty facing up to it and celebrating the people who are heroic in what they face because this is attractive this is uh what will rehabilitate our culture um i'm very convinced so i think when people have a vision of another better life then they can compare and they can say euthanasia is simply not beautiful enough it's not true. It's not good. It's not what I long for. It's not what I desire for my family. I desire accompaniment. I want a story like that one that I read about. I want a story like that one in that movie. So when we present an alternative vision, then we do our part. Just one last thing on that. Someone was recently sharing with me the very unfortunate video of a young woman in Canada standing next to her grandmother who was planning to be euthanized, and she's interviewing her grandmother on TikTok and saying, are you excited, grandma? How are you feeling? And it's it's very, very sad to, to witness this. And someone was raising this video with such consternation and such disappointment. And I couldn't resist but say, well, where are our videos with our grandparents? Where is our alternative vision? And on the one hand, people might think, you don't put everything with your grandma on social media. It's it's too intimate. It's too personal. But I think that's less the issue. We don't need to put everything um, on online. We don't need to um, show off every detail and facet of life. But we have to at least put enough out there that people who don't have an experience of these things in their life have something to look to because there's a poverty of experience because not everyone has grown up with ritual and tradition. And so particularly from my sort of Jewish identity, I'm always thinking about it's up to us to change the situation. It's up to us to turn it around. It's up to us to put into the culture what we see lacking. And so uh, it's, it's sort of easy to lament and bemoan the state of affairs and the decline of civilization. It's much more challenging to buy our own integrity in how we live and by the kinds of things that we put out there, demonstrate a vision of another and better life. Well, that, that that TikTok video you you just mentioned there, I mean, it seems so so trivial, you know. It's such a trivial thing to do, and and uh, I often feel that 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 some you know, something that's also uh, treated very in a trivial sort of way is abortion. Sometimes now with, with the sort of madness surrounding the the Roe v Wade uh, Wade uh, sort of situation in the United States, we hear a lot of arguments put forward from the, the pro-choice campaign, but but few from the pro-life, uh, which is, I guess, obviously due to the overwhelming left-leaning bias of, of, of mainstream media. But perhaps you could outline the arguments of, of, of pro-life. Sure. Well, I think that abortion, like euthanasia, is basically a symptom of the underlying crises in, in our society. And it also has in common with it that it's a kind of settling um, for what is really mediocre. Uh, it's it's not what anyone aspires to. No one kind of, as a child, dreams one day of growing up, having a sexual relationship with someone, deciding that they need to abort the child that they conceived in that sexual relationship. Like, there's nothing about it that kind of fits the script in terms of what uh, young people 
uh, grow up longing for and desiring. So I'm very convinced that for all of these issues, uh, including when engaging our most staunch opponents, that we can do a lot of good by appealing to people's legitimate longings. And when we ask people what the real desires of their heart are, and when we're able to have conversations at that level, we'll see that nobody actually desires these things. These things are a reaction to, uh, and they're a reaction, and again, they're, they're a cry for help. So how can we come around and actually meet that cry, listen to that cry, come alongside and help people to rehabilitate the longings of their hearts so that they're not constantly disappointed and traumatized in this life because there's so much disappointment and trauma and one event begets the next event and so on and so on. So I see this in the obituaries of people who have uh, opted for euthanasia. So often they have had suicides and divorces and many, many um, difficult circumstances throughout their lives. So uh, it's it's just so necessary that we, we see that these are not sheer uh, political opponents who are um, like to, there is a there is a woundedness and there is a suffering that we need to meet with a with a deep compassion uh, and also for their good. I think like I think so much about how much I want the good of Canadians who are who are asking for euthanasia. I want the best for them and the best is not euthanasia. I think of the women who have had abortions, and I want the best for them. I want them to have healing. I want them to be accompanied in their trauma. I want it to not be brushed aside because they know what they have suffered, and they are waiting for someone to acknowledge their grief and not simply minimize and and affirm them. There's a story that this doctor in Canada told recently that really moved me. He's a doctor who had a patient come into the emergency room, and what was her emergency? She was pregnant. There was no particular um, problem with the, the pregnancy, but just she was pregnant and she didn't know what to do. And she told the uh, emergency doctor, who thankfully is very pro-life, she said, I'm pregnant, I don't know what to do. And my, my boyfriend says, it's your body, it's your choice. My parents say, we'll support you, whatever you choose, it's up to you. My girlfriends all say, we're here for you. It's up to you. And she said, I know it's my choice, but nobody has loved me enough to tell me what they actually think would be good for me. And so this doctor spent some time chatting with her. He didn't tell us the substance of their conversation. But when he finished that conversation with her, he tells us she didn't punch him. She didn't report him to the college. She just asked if she could give him a hug because she said, you are the first person in my life who's cared enough to tell me what you think I should do. And so I think that just so well shows the poverty of relationship and accompaniment. People do not just want sheer affirmation and hands off. They want people to say, I'm involved in your life. I love you enough to be involved in your life. That is costly. It's demanding. It's not easy. And yet, it's so much more beautiful. This is a topic that I cannot get uh, any of the women in my life to engage in whatsoever. Like the, the, it comes up organically. It's not we're just talking about it at the dinner table. But if if we're at a, uh, if it comes up and I'm interested in getting in to a yeah, just like a very basic. Uh, let's talk about like, when does life begin or what is life and 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 all that stuff. They all get super hot under the collar straight away and like I'm trying, I think they look at me and they just see like I've got a MAGA hat on and that I'm just like <laughs> desperately trying to take away their rights. I'm just like, anyway, this is all just so I can take it. So I, I'm not quite sure how we get, how we bridge. Well, firstly, what do you think of that phenomenon of just completely, you know, uh, shutting down um, and not talking about it and, and what can we do about that? I absolutely support and encourage the re rehabilitation of the presence of men in the conversation. It's essential because uh, part of the abandonment and part of the, the the neglect that's happening is with the severing of men and women. And we know that every life is created by a man and a woman. And and we need the presence of fathers. We need the sort of responsible, the, the voice of responsible fatherhood in our culture. And again, like a great work of art, sometimes that voice of responsible fatherhood, that paternal gaze toward a person, 
who has suffered, who has been traumatized, who has probably um, suffered things that have rendered a view toward men to be what it is, it can kind of reproach and admonish like a great work of art. Like the way when we look at something beautiful and good, we just feel like we feel our inferiority to it. And then how do we come out of that? How do we kind of grow up into the maturity that we can revere what is good and true while realizing our shortcomings and that we fall short of it. But one thing that I recommend for conversations is to paint two alternative visions. So you can say, here is one man on the one hand. Here's how he lives out his sexuality. Here's how he lives out his relationships. Here's how he treats women. And now here is another. Here's how he lives out his sexuality. Here's how he lives out his relationships. Here's how he um, regards fatherhood and present two opposite visions and then just say see is there not one that you find more attractive and I think by continually presenting the contrast and juxtaposition we can rehabilitate people's uh, longings to be ordered toward what is truly good for them what will really satisfy the desires of their heart so I really recommend that because it's uh it's not dogmatic it's not merely propositional, but it's coming alongside enough to say, you deserve what you recognize to be the best and the ideal. And again, abortion and euthanasia are so obviously not the ideal. They are symptoms of a sort of existential poverty and crisis. They are symptoms of abandonment and neglect, even of having suffered violence and trauma. And so in all of this, it's important so much to remember that This is not so much a culture war as a call to be moved to have compassion on those who have suffered tremendously. And when we maintain this posture, I am quite convinced that we cannot go wrong and that you will have a place in every conversation. Well, Amanda, you've been so generous with your time. I want to give you the final word. So a lot of our listeners, I think we've got a a, a broad base, and I think that... um, there are a lot of disaffected people on the left. I think there's some pe- there's there's some conservative people who listen to us. I think there's a, a a whole range, a lot of women, isn't that right, Ricky? A lot of women listen to us as well. Yeah, a lot of women. But um, so I feel like we've you've we've talked about um the problems, we've talked about the symptoms. So perhaps as a final word, can you can you sell some of our listeners who I know are in are in crisis. We're all in crisis. Well, not all of us, but some. Some uh, there's a lot of uh, people who are in crisis. So, c- could you maybe sell them on, on, on faith? <laughs> wow. Uh, well, I think the most important thing is really to to find hope because certainly in all these conversations, and and hope is very much connected to faith. I have many conversations uh, about these topics that lead to a sort of declinism and even a nihilism among people who share my values completely. And if that's the case, then, then we're not really getting to where we ought to be. The point is ultimately to find hope. And what is the basis for our hope? It's my conviction that there is ultimately always a redemption. It might not happen immediately. This is why the resurrection of the dead, which I've been studying for the past two years in Rome, is, is so important because it's really about redemption, restoration, and uh, overcoming. And so holding fast to the hope that there will be an ultimate vindication of what is good and beautiful and true is a basis for a sort of solidity of identity and a way to go about the world that doesn't just uh, depend on me. That's the openness to transcendence. We have a hope that there will be a, a final vindication of of our hopes, that the desires of our heart are not misplaced, that the brokenness and woundedness of our life can be redeemed, it, we, that we can be restored and made whole. But all of these things depend also on exploring these truths in community and telling stories about them. So I love the quotation of uh, a Danish writer who went by the pen name Isaac Guinness, and she says, all sorrows can be born if you can put them in a story or tell a story about it. And so tell the story of your life because sometimes it is only in retrospect that you can really mine the meaning of what you have suffered. And then when it comes to suffering, I just read a beautiful book a few days ago that talks about how suffering is not a problem to be solved, but a mystery to be lived. So enter into the mystery of suffering. 
I see no better basis for growing in hope and faith than those intimate, trust-filled conversations I was speaking about, where people feel confident enough to bear their wounds to one another. And by finding out that there's a sort of mutuality in our woundedness, we can be a shelter for the wounds of others and accompany one another uh, in living toward that hope of which we are all um, called to walk. So that's those are some closing thoughts. Well, Amanda, uh, we're on a mission with this podcast to get more people reading and, and to get John and I reading more as well. So we have a final question we ask all of our guests, and that is we'd like to know what you're reading right now. Sure. Well, the book I just mentioned uh, is called The Cry of the Heart on the Meaning of Suffering, and it's by uh, Lorenzo Albatente, and a beautiful book on uh, on on really suffering. And I find that uh, while he is coming from a position of faith, he so much has a posture open to a sort of secularity of the world um, with that kind of compassion that is so needed. So I felt that is a great, great book that just came out. Uh, I, I read about it on Plow uh, magazine, so that's a, a good website that I often read some some deep and nuanced reflection um, as well. And I just finished my uh, exams for my two-year program yesterday. Congratulations. So I've been reading a lot. Thank you. Yeah, just last night was the last one. So wrapped up the two-year program here and getting ready to return to Canada to do more work preventing euthanasia. To return to, to the hope. dystopia that is. The, <laughs> the, 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 the Canada has become a, like there's a joke in Futurama where they've got these suicide booths everywhere. And that's what Canada has become, this creepy place where you go can just go to a suicide booth. And yet... There are so many more beautiful stories if we look for them. So I'm going to be on the hunt for stories that will radiate life. And with the glow from Rome that I have uh, from my time here, I, I hope to go back full of confidence. And I do find that it can be very surprising in a in a really fun way to just, when people are declining the state of the world, to just say, actually, I'm full of hope. It kind of creeps people out. They wonder, huh? What, what are you hopeful about? And so I am, so sometimes I don't feel hopeful, but I just say that and I let people be a little bit shocked that I have hope nonetheless. So sometimes I, I say it just until I can believe it. And um, so we just got to hope until until it's real. So Amanda, where can people follow you online? Where, where can they see your work? So they can find my name on uh, Twitter and then follow me there. Also, if you'd like to take a look at dyingtomeetyou.ca, that's the archive of the 365 daily posts about death and dying that I did in 2021. And if they subscribe there, then they'll be added to a, a mailing list and be able to be the first to hear about some exciting unfolding projects in the coming months. Thanks so much, Amanda. It, 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 it's, it, it's a real privilege to talk to you because it's discussions like the one you, you just had with us that that's why we got into this game. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for your interest. And we'll definitely have to have you back on sometime to check in and, and, and see what the situation's like uh, with the sister dying in, in, in Canada in the future. You bet. Let it be a warning to you as well. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening to the New Flesh podcast. If you like our work, please consider rating us on Apple Podcasts or even writing us a review. It really does help the show reach a wider audience. We'll be back with another episode next week. Until then, long live the New Flesh.